So, Brother Warren, please come forward. I'm going to also invite uh, Elder Dan Bush and the elders of the church to come. Elder, if you just stand right here and you face the congregation. And we ask the elders of the church to stand around him. And just want to ask you briefly just a few questions. Is it your desire, by the grace of God, to commit your life and your ministry to doing, fulfilling the responsibility of an elder of, the, of this church? Absolutely. That's pretty strong. Amen? <laughs> <laughs> Is it your desire, by the grace of God, to cooperate with uh, the other elders? And above all, to not only uh, lead by example, but lead others to follow the example of Jesus Christ, our Lord? Yes. Amen. Amen. And last one, is it your desire by the grace of God to help prepare this people and this community for the coming of Christ? Not only preaching the gospel, but living it. Absolutely. Amen. 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 I invite you, Brother Roy, to please kneel. We'll also kneel with you. Congregation, we invite you to bow your heads. And as we get ready to pray, if you wish, if you have uh, unspoken requests at this time, I'm going to invite you just to raise your hand. Unspoken requests. Whatever they may be, God knows. And God has already Take a note. Loving Lord, you're still calling workers into your vineyard. Some you have called at daybreak, some at noontime. And we believe that we are in the very toe of Daniel's image almost at sunset. Yet you're still calling workers. And the good news is that the reward of those who come at sunset will be the same as those you call in the morning. Amen. Today you have called through this church, Brother Roy. We thank you for him. We thank you for his ministry. We thank you for the gifts that he has exhibited here at this church. Lord, we have no power to bless or to ordain. That's your duty. And so we ask, Lord, that through your church, that the setting aside will be from the very throne of God. As you have said, whatever is decided on earth has already been decided in heaven, if we do it according to your will. So we pray that you will order his life, his family life, his uh, religious life, his work life, according to the Holy Scriptures that there will be nothing in his life that will take him away or detract him from the will, from your will, Lord, that he will walk the way of righteousness, that goodness and mercy will be by his side all the days of his life. And as he seeks to visit, to preach, to teach, we will not see Roy, but we will see the Jesus in him. Amen. We pray that you will bless his dear wife, bless this congregation that will be the recipient of his ministry. And we pray that as he serves them, that they will also serve him. That together, we will underscore the ministry of service just as Jesus modeled for us. Amen. Oh God, bless this waiting congregation. The hands were raised, signifying needs or even thanksgivings in our lives. Oh God, we pray that you, your presence will be felt in a marked way this week. That as we move in and, uh, in a, and around people, they might get a sense that Jesus is living in us. Lord, we pray that as this church continues to grow, that those who walk through these doors might sense the Spirit of Christ fully at work. And this will be the place where people are called to righteousness. Thank you again for the church. Thank you for Roy. Thank you for our speaker today. And Lord, we thank you for the celebration of Holy Communion. That as we fellowship around this table, we shall fellowship with Christ prospectively in the future when he returns. Please hear us from heaven your dwelling place this morning. And the things that we have forgotten to ask or fail to ask in our humanness, we pray that you will grant if they be according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Let God's people say amen. 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 Welcome, Roy, to this ministry, and we pray that you will give him your full support. Amen? Amen. 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 Just want to invite Roy's wife to please stand. I believe she's here. She's probably downstairs. Probably. She's doing the work of an elder's wife. Amen? Yes. Amen. Amen. And just before I sit, just want to acknowledge uh, Susan. Uh, Susan, please stand. I understand this is, this is your first Sabbath back.
He's been away, uh, undergoing treatment, and we're so glad that God raised you up. Amen. And you're standing here today. May God bless you and continue to bring healing to your body and to our souls. Amen? Amen. 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 God bless you. At this time, I'd like to invite the deacons forward. Cajun, amen. amen. We're looking forward to the wonderful service that God asked us to carry out throughout the end of time. Our message this morning is entitled, Is It I? Is It I? Before we pray, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the book of John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Now, reading and hearing verses 1 through 5 and then verses 10 and 11. Again, that's John chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, and in verses 10 and 11. Father, we ask now that as we read your words, that you bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from the supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Verse 10. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, Ye are not all clean. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to ensure that we leave here today clean. So for this reason, every heart may be searching right now to ensure that whatever sins may be prominent in our lives, may be left behind today and placed on Jesus. And I pray that you'll take full control of me, dear Lord. Allow your Holy Spirit to speak through me, that the hearts of your people may be touched. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The scene is now the upper room. Jesus spent most of his time ministering to the multitudes in the throng. But on this particular occasion, Jesus understood that his time is very limited. He understood that the work that he has been carrying on must be finished, and he saw that the 70 has already left him. And he also noticed that the 12 that is left behind, they also are not ready. Their hearts are filled with selfishness. So with that, Jesus understood that the work must be carried on, so he said, I must do something to try to win the hearts of these twelve so that when I leave, they will be ready to carry on the work that I began. So Jesus took them aside. And he had a special room prepared. That room was prepared. It had the, the water. It had the tables. It had the, the towels. It had the basins. Everything was ready. There was only one thing that was missing, and that was a servant. There was a servant that was missing. Now we're told that the disciples, they looked each other in the eye, they, they looked around and said, who is going to be the first to begin the service of humility? Now if you remember the disciples, they all often ran to find out who's going to be first in the kingdom. They often ran to see who's going to sit right beside Jesus. They argued often who shall be the greatest in the kingdom, but in the service, none of them took the first step. Their hearts were filled with selfishness. And Jesus had a plan. 
He intentionally had everything laid out. He intentionally did not assign anyone specific. He wanted them to see their selfishness of their hearts, and he wanted them to see that they can never carry forth the work in that condition. So Jesus allowed no one to assign no one specifically for the task. The book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2. Let's notice what the Bible says beginning at verse 6. Philippians chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says beginning at verse 6. Philippians chapter 2 verse 6. Everything was there except a servant. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a what? Of a what? Of a servant. Jesus understood that the purpose in which he came to this world was also to be a servant. But the disciples were not ready to serve. Go back with me to the book of John. John chapter 13. I want you to notice what the Bible says beginning at verse 4. John chapter 13. I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse 4. And this is speaking of Christ. The Bible says in verse 4, He riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. Jesus himself took on that task of humility. Jesus himself took on that task of servitude. Jesus was willing to do whatever it took to win the hearts of sinful men. So he girded himself. And Jesus began to wash the feet of those disciples. And brothers and sisters, those were not ordinary feet. We know as we prepare for communion service, we make sure that those toenails are clipped. Amen? We make sure that those feet are lotioned. We make sure that pedicures take place and make sure that our feet was clean. That was not the kind of feet that Jesus washed. They wore sandals. They walked in the desert. Their feet were dirty. Their feet were muddy. That's the feet that Jesus washed. And Jesus was willing to take the task to clean those feet. But let me hasten to say, Jesus' main interest was not the feet. But he understood in the process of washing the feet, he could wash away the sin of selfishness while it was filling their hearts. And with that towel, Jesus was able to accomplish both tasks. He washed their feet and their feet was clean. But brothers and sisters, he washed their hearts. And their hearts were clean. Jesus was going after the heart. Are you with me, saints? Amen. We have to ensure that when we leave here today, that we give that heart to Jesus so Jesus can say, you are all clean. But notice that Jesus said they were not all clean. Notice what the Bible says in verse 10. In verse 10, the Bible says, Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are not clean, ye are clean, but not all. Verse 11, For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, Ye are not all clean. Not all of them were clean. I wonder why. Verse 21, When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Now can you imagine you're sitting in that room with Christ? You know you have a plan to go out and betray Christ. And Jesus is saying, One of you shall betray me. Jesus was appealing to the heart of Judas. But Judas was, his mind was so fixed. I'm going to carry out that agenda. I'm going to do what I want to do, how I want to do it anyway. Brothers and sisters, that's the worst thing that we can do. Jesus continued to try to appeal to his heart. Notice what the Bible says now in verse 26. Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sup when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sup, he gave it to who? To Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sup, the Bible says, Satan entered into him. That word entered me, he took full control of him. Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. Verse 30, the Bible says, He then having received the sup, went out immediately and...
and it was night. Brothers and sisters, it is always night when we go out to betray Jesus. Jesus was appealing to Judas's heart. Jesus says, he it is I shall betray me. Then he goes over and says, he it is who I give the sup shall betray me. And Jesus knew for a fact that it was him. But his mind just would not change. Can you imagine just Jesus just looking in the face? It's like Jesus was saying, Judas, don't do it, Judas. Judas, don't do it. I, don't carry out your agenda, Judas. I wonder if there's anyone sitting here today that have an agenda that they're still going to carry out that's not in harmony with Jesus' agenda. Jesus is now looking us in the face and saying, don't do it. Don't do it. He continued to appeal to the heart of Judas strategically and systematically for the three and a half years. Jesus already called him in John chapter 6 and said, one of you are a devil. Since then, Jesus was trying to work on his heart. But Judas refused and refused. And unfortunately, Judas is a representation of many of us who are in the church today. We're told that you either enter into the experience of Jesus or you enter into the experience of Judas. There is no in-between. He that is not with me is against me. At some point, there will be a partition and one of us will be either Judas and one of us will be a Jesus. I will pray that we choose to be Jesus. Jesus appealed to his heart. Judas was determined. I'm going to go to church, but that night I'm still going to go and commit fornication. He was determined. I'm going to partake of the communion service, but I'm still going to watch that pornography on the internet. Don't do it, Judas. I'm still going to wear what I want to wear. I'm still going to eat where I want to, what I want to eat. I'm still going to go where I want to go. Judas was determined to carry out his own agenda irrespective of all the appeals that Jesus did to his heart. I pray we have no Judas here today. Jesus looked him in the eye. Please, Judas. Please. I want to save you, Judas. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But is what? Long suffering to usward. Not willing that how many? Any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But there's a balance. In Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11, the Bible says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, the hearts of the sons of men are fully set to do evil. You know that we continue to carry out our own agenda. Why? Because we don't see immediate judgment. But we don't understand that our hearts are becoming more recalcitrant. Our hearts are becoming more hardened. Our hearts are becoming further and further away from God. And then eventually we take one step that was too far. And Jesus' agenda is to save. But not to save men in sin, but what? From, from sin. Judas did not know when that last step was going to be taken. And he continued taking the wrong course. Irrespective of the appeal, he continued to take the wrong course. Jesus continued to appeal to his heart, but then Judas took one step too far. And even though Judas tried to repent, he could not. He had grieved the Spirit of God. And the Bible says, grieve not the Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed. Jesus says, if you sin against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven you. But if you sin against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven. What was the difference between Judas and the rest of the disciples? I want you to think with me. Did the disciples have it together after that upper room experience? No, they did not. Did they all too forsake Jesus when the crisis came? Yes, they did. What was the difference? Let's go to our scripture reading. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. 
We want to find out what was the difference between Judas and the rest of the disciples. All of them forsook him at one point. Even after that uproom experience. But there was a difference. There was a difference between them and Judas. What was the difference? Matthew chapter 26. Beginning at verse 21. The Bible says, And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, let's say these words together, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Lord, is there anything in my life that is betraying you. Is there anything that I'm doing that's betraying you? They for forgot about everyone else that was around them. They forgot about all the apostasy that's taking place in the church. They forgot about everyone else that's partaking in sin. They forgot about mother and daughter and sister and brother. And they said, Lord, is it I? That was the difference between them and Judas. And that could make the difference for us today. We must search our own hearts and say, Lord, is there any wicked thing in me? Lord, is it I? That was the difference, brothers and sisters. We read on. Verse 23 says, And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. Now notice these words, very serious words. Verse 24. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Did you hear those words? Verse 25. Then, after Jesus said that, then, after everyone else had already searched their heart, after everyone else had already said, is it I? Because he felt the guilt, he saw that everyone responded except him, then he said, oh, Lord, is it I? But he didn't mean it. I read to you from the book, Desire of Ages. Inspiration talks about this experience. She said, as they realized the import of his words and remembered how true his saying were, fear and self-distrust seized them. They began to search their own hearts to see if one thought against the master were harbored there. Just one thought. With the most painful emotion, one after another inquired, Lord, is it I? But Judas sat Silent. That's the difference. John, in deep distress, at last inquired, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the, the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. The disciples had searched one another's faces closely as they searched. Lord, or they asked, Lord, is it I? And now the silence of Judas drew all eyes on him. Amid the confusion of questions and expressions of astonishment, Judas now heard the words of Jesus in answer to John's question, but now to escape the scrutiny of the disciples, he asked as they had done, Master, is it I? Jesus solemnly replied, Thou hast said. In surprise and confusion, at the exposure of his purpose, Judas rose hastily to leave the room. Then said Jesus, Jesus unto him, that thou doest do quickly. He then, having received the sub, went out immediately, and it was night. Night it was to the traitor as he turned away from Christ into the outer darkness. Now notice, I want you to listen to these words very closely. The Bible, inspiration says, until this step was taken, Judas had not passed beyond the possibility of repentance. Did you hear that? Until this step was taken, Judas had not passed beyond the possibility of repentance. You see, Jesus understood that Judas was about to take the last step. He understood that. So Jude, I mean, if you read John chapter 13, it's four times that Jesus tried to get the attention of Judas to say, Judas, do not commit that act. Because he knew that time was running out for Judas. But when he left the presence of his Lord, 
and his, and his disciples, and the fellow disciples, now listen, the final decision had been made. He had passed the boundary line. He had passed the boundary line. Turn with me to the book of Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29. I want you to notice what the Bible says. Proverbs chapter 29. And notice what the Bible says in verse 1. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 1. As we begin to close, Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 1. The Bible says, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without what? Without remedy. I say this respectfully. Because of how far Judas has gone, not even Christ could have done anything for him. Do you know that sometimes we can take it so far that our probation closes even when we are alive? The Bible says he liveth, but yet he is dead. There was no remedy for Judas. But I don't want to even hint at leaving your mind that Jesus did not do everything possible to save Judas. I don't want to leave any hint that Jesus' ultimate desire was not to save Judas. I don't want to leave any hint that Jesus didn't do everything possible, laid out everything that he could for Judas to be saved. I don't want to leave that hint. So I'll read you the next paragraph. Wonderful have been the long suffering of Jesus, Jesus in his dealing with the tempted soul. Now listen. Nothing that could be done to save Judas had been left undone. After he had twice covenanted to betray his Lord, Jesus still gave him opportunity for repentance. By reading the secret purpose of the traitor's heart, Christ gave to Judas the final convincing evidence of his divinity. This was to the false disciple the last call to repentance. Now listen. No appeal that the divine human heart of Christ could make had been spared. The waves of mercy beaten back by stubborn pride returned in a stronger tide of subduing love. But although surprised and alarmed at the discovery of his guilt, Judas became only the more determined. From the sacramental supper, he went out to complete the work of betrayal. Jesus did everything possible to save him. Jesus did everything possible to change his mind. Jesus did everything possible to show him what was in his heart, but Judas was determined, Lord, I'm still going to do what I want to do, how I want to do it, when I want to do it. And as a result, Judas' probation closed. Jesus is speaking to our hearts this morning, brothers and sisters, as only he can. I don't know what we are all going through, and I don't need to know. I can't help you. But there's a very present help in a time of need. And that name is Jesus Christ. A story is told of an, a bald eagle in Niagara Falls. He had found a carcass. And he was trying to find a resting place to partake of his catch. And as he scoped down, as everyone was watching, do you know that everyone watches us? As everyone was watching, he finally found a landing spot on a block of ice. But it was a moving piece of ice. And as he landed, he began to eat the carcass, and, the, and, 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 and that, that, that piece, that block of ice is moving towards the edge to fall over the fall. And he began to eat. He's watching and eating. And everyone is watching this taking place. The world is watching us as Seventh-day Adventists. And he continues to eat and continues to eat. And that block of ice is moving. It's getting closer to the edge. And he continues to eat. He says, oh, when it gets close enough, when I've eaten enough, when I've got enough of this world, then I'll lift my wings and begin to fly. And then finally, he got right near the edge. And that eagle began to flap its wings. 
Those eagles have powerful wings. He began to flap his wings and flap his wings, but there was one problem. There was no movement. His feet was planted in that block of ice, congealed together. Sometimes we go so far that our feet are permanently planted in this world. And we, begin that, we believe that at any time we can flap our wings and lift ourselves out of our disparity. The Bible says Jesus is the one that gives us the power to repent. We can't repent when we want to repent. Amen. Don't think that we can always save ourselves whenever we want and however we want. Today, when you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. As we partake of this solemn service, brothers and sisters, Jesus wants us to be clean. But I say this respectfully. Jesus cannot make us clean if we don't make a decision to be clean. We have to be co-laborers with Christ. We have to say, Lord, is it I? I give you whatever is in my heart. I lay my sins on Jesus, the spotless Lamb of God. He bears them all and frees us from the accursed load. Only Jesus can take away the sins, brothers and sisters. But only if we give it to him. We cannot just flap our wings and fly out of sin. We have to place them on Jesus. And did you see what sin did to Jesus? It killed him. If you continue to hold on to your sin, it will kill you. But the difference with Jesus was Jesus was going to be resurrected. Jesus was going to ascend to the Father. Jesus had more of a work to accomplish. If we hold on to those sins and those sin kills us, there is no hope for a resurrection second resurrection of damnation. So maybe there might be someone here that says, Lord, I want to lay my sins on you right now. And the blessing, brothers and sisters, do you know that irrespective of everything that has taken place the entire life, if you've been alive for 90 years and been a sinner for 90 years right now, you can be clean. 50 years, you can be clean. You think about David. David committed adultery. David lied. David murdered. And Jesus looked on David and said to Jeroboam, You have not kept all my commandments like my servant David. Want to know why? Because there was a Psalm chapter 51 where David said, Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. David said, Lord, is it I? And David is clean. David has the blessed hope of a resurrection. Perhaps I says, Lord, I want to have that same experience. I want to leave here clean this morning. I understand that I've done a lot. Oftentimes I'm, I feel so guilty like I cannot overcome. I feel so guilty that I've hurt so much people that I just feel like I cannot be forgiven. That's the devil speaking to you, brothers and sisters. You can leave here today and be clean. Are you with me, saints? Is that your desire this morning? Praise God. Praise God. That is your desire. Let us all reverently kneel together as far as you're able. If not, just bow your heads where you are. We want to make sure that we leave here clean. Amen? The difference between Judas and the rest is that Judas did not lay his sins on Jesus. Oh, Father, we're so thankful that you've wrote, written experiences in the Bible of those that were sinners. You could have just wrote, written all the glamorous experiences of all the blessings and, uh, of all the, the saints of the past and saints of old. But you have accounts that David was an adulterer and a murderer. You have account that Solomon had a thousand concubines. You have account that Abraham lost faith in you and decided to go outside of his marriage. You have accounts that Peter betrayed you. These are experiences that we can cleave from to know that you are a long-suffering God. You are a merciful God. But you also have accounts to say that there is a limit to your forbearance. And we never know when we'll take that one step that's too far. So we don't want to throttle the fence, Lord. We don't want to tiptoe along the 
edge of sin and righteousness. We don't want to take one foot inside of the church and one foot out. We don't want to have one step on the side of Christ and one step on the side of Satan. All the way my Savior leads me. And we pray that we'll follow Jesus all the way. And as we partake of this service, dear Father, we pray that we'll all leave here clean. And because I know how the devil works, the devil might say, well, I, somebody might be here that's saying, well, I know I'm going to commit an act of sin anyway. So I'm, I, I, I'll just not partake of the service. Jesus says, if you do not wash, you have no part with me. So the one choice that you've given us is to wash and be clean. May we choose to serve you today, Lord, so that we can leave here clean as if we have never sinned. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.